Food Auto Line, and uh, that will uh, put you in the running to win $100. And you can get the app at the iTunes store or at an Android store. And Ben, do you got those yet? Yeah, so we <coughs> DCAutoGeek.com right. and WardsAuto.com. Okay, so we want to thank our, our media partners streaming the show along with us tonight, WardsAuto.com and DCAutoGeek.com. And moderators are DC Auto Geek and Scott in Cleveland. Okay, and... Uh, Scotty. Yeah, we want to thank Scott in Cleveland and uh, DC Auto Geek for helping us monitor the chat room. And I have to apologize to Roaster Jack because I was up in Traverse City where he is, and he actually gave me a call, and I was just so flat out busy with that conference, yeah. I never got to, ch you know. He's sending us that. a new shipment of coffee, so. Excellent. Check so. him out, greatnoroco.com, good and, stuff. And if you're listening, uh, Roaster Jack, I'll, I'll give you a call, but man, I, I was just, I was doing 14 hour shifts up at that conference. It just got a little bit out of hand. And we'll get going momentarily. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all new Chevrolet Cruise, get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. Well, thanks for joining us, folks. I'm back here with Peter again, and uh, man, oh man, Peter, it's turning into another crazy time in this auto industry. Oh, yeah, meltdown on, the, on Wall Street is, I think, topic number one. Yeah, uh, this may not be good for the auto industry. Oh, I don't think it's good at all. Consumer confidence is going to go in the tank, and... But if you want to buy a car in the next, you know, 65 days, there's going to be some deals out there. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, of course, we're talking about today, uh, the Dow Jones was, you know, off like over 500 points. Yeah, All the automotive stocks got hammered along with this, of course. But it was a gr apparently a global meltdown. Too. Right. Not just here in the U.S., but all over the place too yeah i mean i i don't know i still think it's these idiots in washington that help trigger what's going oh yeah on right that now. didn't help the whole budget thing really it it pissed the country off and you know people are like you know maybe we're not making any progress at all in the economy you know with no consumer confidence right bad for the auto industry right and uh kind of reminds me of how things were really plunging uh, a few years back <laughs> precipitating the big collapse, but yeah. we did come out of that. Yeah. So I haven't given up hope yet. No, no, it's, you know, it's, there have been bad days on Wall Street before, you know, so. Well, you know, GM must feel uh, especially miffed about it because here they come out and report an increase in their profits by 89%, which is a staggering increase and their stock just gets hammered for it, you yeah. know, along with the rest of the market. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be the, the way it is, you know. And, uh, you know, we saw July car sales were soft. Tepid. Tepid at best. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, we're not out of the woods. I mean, people are saying, you know, oh, well, we're, you know, great guns. And you're right, GM delivers those profit numbers, and it's just like, not only does the stock gets hammered, but it gets buried in the Wall Street story. Right. So they're like, wow, that was special. The one thing I found fascinating in the, the July numbers, though, was Toyota sales. Because if you look to a year ago, they're really down. I mean, they're horrible. But if you compare June to July, they were up strong. And I thought these guys were out of inventory. I thought they didn't have the, you know, the cars on the lots to be able to have a huge increase in sales. But they did. Camry went back to number one in the market in pass car. You know, Toyota, <clears throat> this blip in Toyota's history may not be lasting very long. You know, anyone who counts them out is crazy. They're going to be tough. And, and they're pissed off. And they want to prove a point. So it's going to be uh, 
it's going to be interesting. And they have a lot of cash. <clears throat> so you, their incentive spending shot up. I think it was up 20% or something. Oh, like the that. incentives in the next, like I said, the next, well, next 90 days are going to be staggering. It's going to hurt everybody, but they're hurt their bottom line. Yeah, they're going to do it. Right. They're going to do it. Well, Toyota, I think, has got to do whatever it can to get people back in the showrooms, and they're yeah. doing it. I mean, I was stunned at how how much strength they showed. And again, their numbers are still weak, but I'm saying if you compare June to July, July was uh, substantially better for them. Yeah, it, it might be a while before they get momentum, you know, real momentum, but mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere. Right. Not going away, you mean, yeah, right? They're not yeah, going no, anywhere. I ran into, uh, I was up at the management briefing seminars, which is a conference that the Center for Automotive Research puts on in uh, Traverse City, Michigan every year. I think I went to the first one back in 1986 or something like that. And we had um, Jay last, Barron last, yeah, week. last week, so he uh, had to go. Right. <laughs> but uh, I ran into some of the Toyota people and, you know, I was talking to them about this, and they said, well, just wait, because our assembly lines are not going to be back to full speed until the end of September. So if they can show this kind of strength, you know, with uh, not a lot of inventory on hand, watch out. Yeah. They're not out of this game by any stretch. No, no, no. They're... Hey, and what'd you make of consumer, re consumer reports just slamming the Honda Civic? You know, I went into this a little bit in my column because I talked about Dieter Zetsch's uh, letter to the troops, which we'll get to, but you know this image thing is is so difficult to achieve and maintain and and hang on to. And did Honda all of a sudden forget how to build good cars? No. no. Uh, Consumer Reports rated them like 17 points down. It, I think it has everything to do with image. The buzz is off Honda. Mm -hmm. You know they're not. They're not on the edge, they're not where they should be, and I think, it, you know, I'm not a big fan of Consumer Reports, never have been. Nope. You know, people who shop their cars by that magazine are crazy, but they're also people who don't give a shit about cars. Right. So, you know, you take it with a grain of salt, and, you know, I think they just, they don't think Honda's cool, and they just found fault, but did Honda forget how to build cars? No. You know, and the, is the Civic, yeah, they might have cheapened the interior bits a little bit, but is it a bad car? No. No, it's not a bad car. No. That's right. It's just, uh, and the SI coupe is nice, and mm -hmm. I just, you know, I just, I don't know. It just winced with that, with Consumer Reports, all the hand-wringing going on now. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, you know, now that Consumer Reports is saying it, the rest of the country is going to catch on. But as we've talked about on this show, I mean, they've had a string of duds come out. The cross tour has not caught the world on fire. Oh, yeah. The CRZ is no great shakes. The Insight is not all that great a car. They've been the, on a bad roll. The Acura ZDX is, uh, you know, hit the market with the biggest thud I've ever seen any new vehicle hit the market. You know, there's still all five speed automatic transmissions, no direct fuel, and, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about. Now, what's gone wrong at that company? They lost their mojo, they lost their vision, they lost their reach. They forgot what their founder was about. But, but about. clearly, you know, like you're saying, they've got top-notch engineers. They've got top-notch people. This is, you got to lay this right at the foot of management. Yeah, I yeah, mean, absolutely. It, but I think Consumer Reports, and a separate issue, you know, they're just, they're just piling on with, this is like a cumulative score for everything. They're just saying, yeah, you're done with, the, we're done with you, and we're moving on to Hyundai. Right. That's our new... <laughs> <laughs> Bow down to and we'll love Hyundai. Yeah. Right. So what were you talking about, Dieter Zetchen? The, well, the he the wrote an internal memo to the troops before they went on their summer vacation, which they still do over there, which is nuts. <laughs> the month of August, yeah. it's called. Right. And um, he said, we are going to get back and compete again with BMW and Audi. And, you know, even though it was an internal memo, it's the first time I can remember, recall, in modern history or at any time where Mercedes admitted that they're not the big dogs anymore. And I thought it was staggering. I mean, they, you know, they talk about losing their mojo. I mean, yeah, they're still selling cars and stuff, but it's not the same Mercedes. I well, mean, remember, 
him and uh, uh, Wolfgang Bernhardt were the guys who ran Chrysler. Yeah. And they didn't leave Chrysler in a very good position. No, but let's not forget that Jurgen Schrempp engineered that, who I consider one of the worst CEOs Evil. in automotive history. <laughs> Evil. And he, they overpaid for it. And then they, you know, they got scared right after they got in there. They realized what they had. And then they said, start cutting. You know, we got a, we got a doomsday scenario here. And, it just went from bad to worse, and then, of course, Cerberus finished them off. That's right. And then the U.S. government handed the company to Sergio for, like, a $5 bill. <laughs> right. But, I mean, you know, this, this memo by Dieter was just like an admission. We're, we're going to fight Audi and BMW. You know, so it's like, in other words, we're not the top dog anymore. And, you know, it's like, wow. But that has everything to do with image. I talked about how they walked away from engineered like no other car in the world. Yep. And then they went to unlike any other, which was like, really? What does that mean? And then they went to, this is Mercedes Benz. And now they're now you know I don't mind the best or nothing because that was Gottlieb Daimler's uh, Daimler's personal motto. Mm -hmm. That's good, but. You know, they lost their mojo image-wise. People don't, they used to be Mercedes was like, wow, it's a Mercedes. They're a cut above, they're better than the rest. They haven't been better than the rest in a long time. They haven't, and if he's Now they're fighting back, they've got some great stuff coming, but again, this image thing is so fragile, it takes years to get it right, and then you walk away from it, you're done. It's like BMW, you know, they spent 25 years seeding the ultimate driving machine in the American consumer consciousness, and then they, they walk away for five minutes on joy, and it's just like, huh? What are you guys doing, you know? But I, you know, and I, I slam a German, the typical German marketing executive in the auto business is really, they've got bad track records. You know, they're, they're, they come over here and they tell, tell their dealers what, how it's going to be, what they're going to do, and then they usually screw it up royally. And then they ship those guys out and bring in a new wave in, and they're always trying to tell the U.S. market what's good for them. Doesn't work that way. But if you say uh, Dieter Zetsch is saying, okay, we're going to start fighting back, I mean, it takes three years to get new product in the showroom. But well, you say they've got new stuff coming. Is that going to be yeah, soon no, enough? Yeah, no, they've got new stuff arriving now, and they've got new stuff coming. But, but is it the right new stuff? Yeah, and, but it, I just thought it was fascinating that here was Mercedes-Benz internally realizing that finally, you know, that, you know, they're, they're just not the best anymore. Yeah, have a nice vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said, yeah, get rested and come back and we'll resume the fight to reestablish Mercedes as the best. Good luck with that. You mentioned Marchione. He was up at this conference I was at. And one interesting thing, I mean, he had a lot to say, which was kind of interesting, too, because he covered a lot of different topics. But warning the auto industry about China was one of them. Yeah, you know, I and I agree with them, but I, I wrote about that a couple of years ago. I mean, you know, this isn't going to go well uh, if this country doesn't prepare for that. And, you know, if they want to call it protectionism or whatever, I mean, you know, they could literally take 30% of the market right out from under the what's left of the U.S. car companies. And Yeah, that's the, one of the points he made is uh, China's now the largest car producer. It's growing. He said even if they only export 10% of that production, all the other car companies are at grave risk. So his warning was, we better get our industrial act together here because the day of reckoning's coming. Yeah. The other big news was he's hanging around at 2015, 2016. It was just like, really? I mean, you know, he's reorganized the company, but it all hinges still on, on him. him. So basically what I'm seeing is if this organizational structure doesn't change between now and the time he, he uh, hangs up his espresso pot and goes counts his money somewhere, they're not going to be equipped to survive because he is going to position management to the point where it will only work with him and his habits and the way he does things. That ain't going to work when he walks away. No, you're right. And uh, as we've talked about before, you know, it's uh, so curious to see the board of directors let him do that. 
the results have been there so far, and I got to believe that's why they're saying, keep it going, Sergio, whatever you want. But you're absolutely right. That's the one Achilles heel, and it's a big, uh, important Achilles heel yeah. in the structure that he's building in those companies. Because if the China crank, if China cranks it up, you know, but 2016 or whatever, you know, who's the most vulnerable? Could be Chrysler, again. Could be, could easily be. Although they had a pretty terrific uh, June. Yeah, they did. I mean, now that's year over year. Compared to <laughs> July, it didn't look all that good. Yeah, and all, all these first on the block I mean, compared to June, not July. Yeah, all these first on the block types are paying through the nose for these Fiat 500s, and but once they're done, then we'll see. The 500 actually had a pretty good month. They did about 3,000 units. Well, that's what I meant. I mean, the first in the block, we're still in the first in the block yeah, phase. Okay. Uh, I got to get me one of those. Right. After those people are done, we'll see. I, That'll be the real. Well, that's what I, I would agree. You know, we, we need to see you six know, months. They might be numbers. hot for 12 months, but then it's just like, then the dealers are going to be looking at their watches. Where are all the people? Yeah, and oh, where's they, the rest they, of the lineup? Yeah, they all they all bought them. They're not coming back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's on to the next one. Right. That's right. Well, yeah, actually, uh, like I said, uh, the Detroit 3 had a pretty good month if you compare it to a year ago. But if you compare it to the month prior, uh, very, very weak. You know, in fact, uh, declined for uh, the Detroit 3. And, you know, back to Dieter, you know, BMW is just making money hand over fist and just kicking ass. And so. And Audi's doing terrific. No, well, Audi's just. I mean, in the, in the U.S. market, they trail by a wide margin, but I'd rather have their momentum. Yeah, absolutely. They've got products coming. I mean, it's just, you know, they're on, a, they're on an upward trajectory. Yeah. Uh, we got plenty more to talk about here, but what let's take a... What happened in Traverse City? Well, let's get into that, but let's take, take, a, a break. take a break. And uh, Ben, let's thank our friends at Chevrolet for helping sponsor this show. Not only does the Chevrolet Cruze offer a ton of features, it features some of the best safety and maintenance in the business. The Cruze comes with rear park assist, which beeps if you're about to back into something. It has rollover mitigation, which means the car senses if it might roll over, and applies the brakes to the outside front tire to bring the car back under control. And it has OnStar vehicle diagnostics, which sends you emails about the latest status of your car. And you can learn a lot more about it at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. So yeah, the, the management briefing seminars, this big automotive conference in Traverse. Uh, day one kicks off with, uh, I guess it's the plant manager for Volkswagen at their new U.S. plant in Chattanooga. And you know, the UAW has been saying, oh, you know, we're, we're talking with Volkswagen and we're talking with the workers there and we'd really like to organize that plant. And their plant manager gets up there and goes, really? <laughs> we haven't talked to them at all. They haven't talked to our workers. I haven't talked to them. Well, we don't know what they're talking about here. And the week before, what was the headline in my column? Bob King speaks with forked tongue. I mean, I don't buy any of this, oh, it's a kumbaya. This is a new union. This is, you know, we're talking to everybody. We're going to get this. And we're, we're, this is an era of cooperation. I'm not buying it any of it. Well, then it's a good thing you weren't in Traverse City because Bob King was. Oh, oh yeah. And the Kumbaya talk all over. Oh, him. yeah, 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 I know. I, I've read it. You know, it's just like I know, this campaign, but when the, the plant manager gets up there and says, there's none of that happening, then, you know, there's a credibility issue. Here. There really is. And uh, King was, his message in this talk was really aimed at suppliers because that's mostly who was in the audience here. And he was saying, you really should, uh, you know, let your workers organize with the UAW and we'll make your quality go up and you'll have much better operations. And I don't think he persuaded one supplier CEO in the audience whatsoever. No, it didn't sound like it. And uh, there were some other interesting things up there, too. Uh, there were a uh, couple of environmentalists on one of the panel. John. Yeah. John DeChico, who we've had on the show right. here, who I, I consider a very sensible and rational yeah. environmentalist. And he had a chart up there that was mind-blowing to me in which he showed that from a greenhouse gas standpoint in the U.S. that a battery electric vehicle is barely better from a greenhouse gas standpoint than a turbo diesel. 
and he showed that a plug-in hybrid is barely better than a regular hybrid. And, uh, and, you know, I went up to him afterwards and I said, did I read that chart right? Did I hear you straight that, you know, a battery electric's really not that much better? And he says, no, because we still use so much coal to generate electricity that on a BTU basis, as delivered to the gas tank or to the electric plug on a car, he said, electricity in the United States is twice as carbon intensive as gasoline. Now, the electric car is more efficient, so it does come out ahead, but, but not by fair. much. Yeah. And what I found interesting is John DeChico truly, really believes in global warming and climate change. And uh, I might argue with him on that, but he really believes it. But what I found so interesting is he wants to see us do something about it. He wants to see us do something about it fast and as effectively as possible. And what he's saying is electrics ain't the way to go because they're so much more expensive, they're going to be adopted so much more slowly that if we did more advancements in gasoline engines or adopted more turbo diesels in the U.S. market, we'd achieve far more, far faster at a lot lower cost. And, and what have we said about the internal combustion engine? There's still a long way to go there is. in terms of efficiency. And I, I still think that's going to be much more productive. Mm -hmm. than shoving electric vehicles down people's throats. Now, in some cases, electrics work for people, that's great, but it's not the total uh, solution. No, electrics will, will form a niche that yeah. people will want, and that's great, and, yeah. and hopefully some automakers will make money selling it to yeah. them. In about 10 years. If then, but uh, you know, I keep pointing out hybrids don't sell that well, and I, you know, they're two and a half percent of the market. So I give electrics one percent of the market. When you start getting gasoline engines that are, are, are cars that are, you know, decent performance, roomy enough, and everything, and they're in the 40s mpg, that's plenty for people. You know, people right. say, "Wow, that's pretty good." You know, right. Now, if gas goes to six, seven, eight, nine, ten bucks a gallon, that's a different thing. Yeah. But you know, as we've talked about here too, I'm I'm a contrarian. I think we're more likely to see two fifty a gallon, oh, five right. bucks a gallon. Yeah, you're, yeah. <laughs> hey, Alan Mulally's out doing the uh, the yeah. television circuit. He was on the Charlie Rose show, which did you is see uh, that? I did see that. And oh, was I didn't see that. I saw the Letterman. Yeah, well, and well, I'll talk about Charlie Rose's okay. show, and then you talk about Letterman's show, but for those who don't know, Charlie Rose is a, a talk show host on public television. Uh, pretty good guy. I mean, he really uh, gets he into a lot in of depth. detail. A lot of detail, a lot of depth. Uh, and just to give you an idea, their set is no set at all. They sit at a, a round oak table, and there's you know, no background at all. It's just all black. So all you're focusing on is Charlie Rose and his guest. And Alan was brilliant, as he is. And especially for those who have never seen Alan Mulally in action, you know, they just fawn all over him because he's such a good communicator. I don't think I learned anything new in the show whatsoever, but it exposed Alan Mulally to an audience that probably didn't know a whole lot about him. Yeah. And he said things in a way that I think a public television audience will really go, my God, Ford Motor Company, you guys rock, I want to buy your cars. Yeah, and you know, it was more of the same on Letterman. And, and first of all, Letterman was, you can tell when Letterman wants a guest on there, and, and he really wanted Alan on there. And he was, you know, uh, talk to him, ask him about the right questions. Dave had some facts and figures from Alan's Boeing stint at the ready, which even caught Alan <laughs> off guard. But, uh, you know, uh, it's hard. Leaders like Alan come along this business very like, rarely. Very rarely. Like uh, once a century, just like, about. Yeah, I mean, it's a. He had an absolutely brilliant career at Boeing, 37 years, and then Bill Ford calls him and keeps calling him, keeps calling him, and Alan, you know, it was like getting the call. Like this is, there's a bigger, uh, there's a bigger calling here to help an American industry that really needs help, and the iconic one of the, you know, the iconic names in uh, American manufacturing history. And he took it upon himself and he believed in it. And when he's on these shows, I mean, you know, 
It's, he's, no one can touch him. No, I mean, he is just uh, absolutely gifted at that. And here's what I'm reading into it as well. The UAW has been savaging him for his compensation. They're saying oh, that yeah, the amount of money that he's making. Well, Bob Kings is morally wrong and all this right, stuff. Right. Get off your high horse. And outrageous and all that. I think Ford Motor Company, public relations, deliberately wants Allen out there right now oh, absolutely. to counter this because yeah. you know you talked all about this image and how fragile it can be and if you've got a major labor leader attacking this captain of industry saying he's immoral for taking this money it's outrageous all you have to do is throw Allen out in front of the public and they go oh my gosh this guy's fantastic and uh, Letterman's been trying to get him on for two years is that right yeah well, then, I, I, I smell a Ford public relations campaign deliberately letting well, and, Alan out there now. And I'll tell you, when he's out there, like he said, the whole PBS audience who watches Charlie Rose would be like, wow, this guy's... And a younger audience that watches Letterman, yeah. you know, they're appealing to di different demographic groups. But They had the, the new Focus electric car on stage, and they drove it like 30 feet or something. Was, right. Yeah, was, Speaking of which, the, the, another sideline here to the, the Traverse City Conference that I was at, uh, every night they have a cocktail party, which is absolutely the best part of the conference. Yeah, you listen to all these top-level executives, yak, 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 you know, give their, their commercial, essentially. And then you go out onto uh, this big tent that they've got outside, and now you get to talk to everybody, and it, it's mm -hmm. great networking opportunity. I ran into a guy who's a big contractor, construction company, that specializes in building large photovoltaic solar arrays. Uh, he put in uh, the, the Ford uh, plant where they are, they're going to make the, the electric focus at the, the Wayne Assembly plant. I, I think he even put in the big solar array for GM at its uh, Hamtramck plant. He's also putting in the big windmills for wind energy. So I go, okay, does this stuff make sense? And he looks at me straight in the eye and goes, John, this is just a bunch of nonsense. It doesn't work at all. He said these photovoltaic arrays that the car companies are putting at their plants take 102 years to pay back. And they wear out in 20 years. And he said the wind stuff is just as crazy. So here's this guy making all this money building these things, but is going, this is nuts. And he said as soon as the government incentives come off, these things, no one's going to build this stuff. Oh, man. Well, the government incentives are going to look, sounds like they're going to be going away in a lot of stuff. Sure does. And then, uh, again, jumping topics. This last week, uh, we had a, a great car show just down the road here uh, yeah. for what they call the Concours of America. Formerly known as the Meadowbrook Concours. And uh, the Meadowbrook uh, location is a beautiful location. Uh, the old Dodge Mansion. But the people there. who run it are tone deaf and they don't get it. And they think that. They treated, you know, one of these, you know, one of the pre preeminent car shows in America like, you know, like dirt. Yeah. So they moved to this new place. And they had been, so they finally had had enough. Right. So they moved. But I went to it and it was a pretty good car show. Uh, one of the, the highlights for me is they had 33 Indy cars, literally from the very beginning, uh, you know. Contemporary. And actually a little bit before that, they actually had a, a 1908 racer, which predates the Indy 500. Right, right. All the way up to some of the most recent winners there. And I started, and they had them in uh, rows of three. Eleven just, rows of three. And so I started at the very back with the most modern cars and started to work towards the front of the field. And it was just so cool to see how the cars devolved into what they were, rather than starting at you know, yeah. 1908 and wor working my way to 2010, you know, which I think was the most recent car they had there. And uh, you know, the cars get bigger and taller and wider, and uh, it, it was was a neat effect. I thought that was really cool having that lineup of race cars there. Yeah, but you know, you and I both say the same thing. Indy needs to get back to that free form innovation that, you know, pays off for the cars we drive every day right, down not, the road. Not just a spec series. Yeah, no, they can't do that anymore. The 2012 will be interesting. Uh, new engine manufacturers, 
it's the first time the and uh, manufacturers are going to get to develop their own packages. Mm -hmm. um, so Honda, Chevrolet, and Lotus. Uh, uh, will be developing their own packages. So that's going to be somewhat more interesting. It's than a the, good step in the right direction. Yeah, but they've got a long way to go. And Randy Bernard, as I've said before, has switched on, and, well, there's a nice Ferrari there. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, we've got a, a guest coming on with us now, uh, Dave Snyder, who's going to be joining us. So let's take a commercial break. And okay. he's a painter. He paints a lot of really cool stuff, and we've got to talk to him about what he does. But... Uh, in the meantime, Ben, why don't we thank our good friends at Hyundai for sponsoring this show. The sixth generation of the Hyundai Sonata is taking the industry by storm, and no wonder. It offers a fluidic design theme that gives it a strikingly modern, coupe-like exterior design, and yet the interior provides the roominess of a full-size car as measured by the EPA. The Sonata also provides an eco-friendly interior with soy-based foam for the seats. Put it all together with Hyundai's strong reliability and value proposition, and you've got yourself a really compelling package. Check it all out at HyundaiSonata.com. Okay. Dave Snyder, thanks for joining us here on AutoLine After Hours. That's my pleasure. It's very exciting. So tell us a bit about yourself. You brought a, a book here that's got a whole bunch of different paintings of uh, what looks like classic American muscle cars, by and large. By and large, yes. Um, I, I have started um, about uh, 15 years ago doing automotive art. And what I wanted to do was tell a story. Um, I, I have these memories of going to the dealership in 1958 and seeing my first dead soul when my grandfather took me and and the excitement of of, of that and cruising in, in the high school years uh cruising the the frisch's big boy and and all the cars that used to come into the the, the cruise nights i mean i this that's the excitement that i wanted to put down on canvas and share with everyone and tell a story with my art and you have very realistic looking kinds of paintings tell us a little bit about how you try to paint these cars well they're all hand drawn hand painted um you know i start with a blank piece of paper and start drawing individual cars and start composing and then start um with, uh, and then putting in the backgrounds and the, and the gas stations and doing the research on the on the architecture of the day and the signage of the day and the details of the cars and 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 what what gas pumps would have been in that gas station and what signage would have been in that dealership. I mean, half the fun of it is is doing the research that goes into it to making sure that it's accurate. Because you know, I get um, if I've got the trim wrong on a car or I have the wrong hubcaps or the wrong wheels. So you're I not get, painting this from a photograph. Oh no no. No, these are from my memories. Now, I use photographs as as reference, uh -huh. um, but there's no photograph that exists of 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 um, this they're dealership. They're almost photorealistic. Um, actually, they're better um, <laughs> than photorealistic. <laughs> if you say so yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, no. I mean, w w with um, with photorealist artists, you can tell the photorealist artist with with the reflections and the 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 errant reflections that they put into the work. Um, me, I can take those out. I can edit. I can edit down. To, um, to exactly just what I want to put in there to convey the story that I want to tell. And one of the cool things I, I, I see here is you did uh, the GM Motorama of 1954. And um, talk I, a little bit about, you know, why you did that and what's in this painting. And I started with 1953, the Motorama, because that was my birth year. Um, but I was doing some research at the, the GM Heritage Center at, in the photo archives on signage of, I was doing some dealership um, 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 research on what signs, when the signage changed, what, what kind of banners were hanging in the showroom, um, just what the dealerships looked like. And just for kicks, I typed in Motorama and Pandora's box opens up. And all of these- Now wait a minute, that's supposed to be a bad thing, Pandora's no, no, box. No, 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 well, well, this was-, this was um, In a good way. The, in a good this way. This is the good Pandora. Because it, it just stopped me, it stunned me, all these engineering drawings and all these photographs of, of the, the GM Motoramas, just spectacular. I had to do, paint the, the, the scenes. So I, I would gather up, the, the scene was done from about 40 photographs. 
And the surprising thing about doing painting these car designs and, and painting the, the, the motoramas was that you can see from the Chevrolet Bel Air all the way to the, the Cadillac Eldorado, you can see the design cues of, you can see the GM family, you can see Harley Earl. And You're saying from, every di car. from different brand to different brand, you see a similarity. There's design or, or cues that go. Family resemblance. I shouldn't say a similarity. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And then it's not only about just the car design and the car colors and, and the spectacular stage shows that they used to put on, but the sets that they used to build were incredible. And it's a study in mid-century modern design. You, you see the, the, the furniture makers used to go to the GM Motoramas to get ideas to build their furniture. Just, it was exciting. And uh, you do some racing stuff here too. You've got some of the great Trans Am and NASCAR races I, uh, I have, of, the, of yeah. the 1960s and early 70s. I have, yeah, uh, the, the Trans Am, some early um, um, uh, NASCAR work. But, but really the focus is on the memories of, of just, just hanging out. You know, when I was when I was a a kid and when I was a teen, the dealerships is is a, um, and I have this penchant for the famous dealerships too. The, yeah, the I see Royal Pontiac in here, which I, you know, I was at. And the one that I'm working on in studio now, um, I think there's a photo of me on the, um, um, that I sent along. I, I'm I'm doing Royal Pontiac again. Are you Which from this area? You, you don't live here now. Oh, no, no, no. No, I've, and, and I've done, I'm not from Chicago either, but I've done Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge four times. I visited that. I've done a painting from, from the, the showroom side, from the used car side, um, inside the dealership, and, and one inside the, um, the service department. So, so you've done the research even to find out what were the hot dealerships that sold the hot cars back then. Not only do I do the, real sh the, the research on the dealership, um, in the case of, for example, Mr. Norm's Grand Spalding Dodge, um, I went and, and met with Norm Krauss. He co-signed all the prints, but I met with him and we went through the old dealership and I said, well, and he said, well, you know, over here we had, this is where we wrote up the, the, the service orders and, and then we had, um, uh, you know, service bays down here and the dyno was back here, but up here was the, the, the parts department, we always had a, um, a Hemi up on an engine stand so that we could demonstrate how to, you know, when you buy this uh, manifold and, the, and that carburetor, how this goes on. I mean, that's the type of research I go into. And do you I, then incorporate that into those details into the paintings? Absolutely. Um, went to, um, I, I've done um, Yenko Chevrolet, Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania twice. And actually went down in the town of Cannonsburg and there's a little Dairy Queen across the street and I just sat there and just sketched and, and tried to imagine Yenko Chevrolet in 1969. What would be pulling in? Home of the, the famous out? Yenko Stingers, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Yenko Camaros and in the Chevelles and and the uh, Corvair was the Stinger. Mm -hmm. That's what I love, you know, just just telling those stories with as much detail as I possibly can. How does that help your painting? I mean, not just the detail. It's there, there's got to be a, a flavor in essence that you're trying to capture. That's exactly right. Yeah, there there is a flavor in essence. It's it's. Um, uh, People tell me their stories, and, and I try to put those in, into, into the pieces. Um, get the right cars, get the right colors. And, and speaking of the right colors, when I sit down and I'll uh, mix up paint, I, I paint an acrylic on board, I'll have the manufacturer's paint chip books sitting in front of me to mix paint to. Because, I mean, you know, um, Plum Crazy's got to look like Plum Crazy. And um, Sassy Grass Green has got to look like Sassy Grass Green. And if, you know, so that, that's, that's the, the extent of the, of the accuracy that I like to put into my paintings. Have you always been a painter? I have. Um, ever since I, you know, I remember drawing airplanes on the living room wall. <laughs> or, not wall, but but in the living room, you know, and putting them up on the wall, and okay. and and um, um, I, I've always wanted to be an artist, 
I've, I've always have gone to galleries and think, wow, wouldn't it be cool to you know do that for the rest of your life? And um, so you're living the dream. I'm I'm living the dream. But for 25 years, I worked in advertising and promotion and, and public relations as an art director and designer. So a lot of that translated into now I now promote myself. Um, I, I know how to talk about myself, obviously. <laughs> uh, you know, many artists can't even talk, right. about their, talk about their work, but um, but, but I find it um, easy to do because I spent uh, you know years advertising other other products, and uh, I apply that to, to myself now. So, with all the research and everything that you do, how long does it take to do one of these paintings? Um, depending upon the painting, there, but there's between 300 and 450 hours. Now that's just a guess. Um, in the case of the, the couple of Motorama pieces I've done, or the the, the big um, um, Bryce Road painting um, that, that you can see on, on my website, it, it th this took sometimes three weeks just to draw before I even started applying paint. So again, you get the drawing right. You get that you work it until it's and until you have one final master drawing, and you transfer that onto an illustration board, and then you start painting on that. So there's a lot of time. Um, I don't keep track. I'm guessing it's between 300 and 450 hours. If I if I kept track, then I'd have to do math. It'd be like work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to approach it. Yeah. Um, so when you do all your research and get all these details and the colors and everything that you're looking for, can you then knock out several paintings based on that knowledge? Um, sure, yeah. You, you're always um, gaining knowledge with, with um, uh, each painting you do, and your library gets larger, just as, as all of us. We all have that, that library, and, and uh, people send me photos or of, um, of, of their gas station that they, they their, their family um, owned, and you know it, th that's what's fascinating about it is you you get to meet people and you get to you you start accumulating this this stuff. Well, here as we flip through the book, you got a '59 Impala, which is one of my all-time favorite cars in the history of the world of all time because it's to me it's rolling sculpture. And and it, that's exactly right. I'm I'm painting someone else's art, uh, um, and I'm the. You mentioned um, St. John's. I was there showing my art last weekend. At the Concours of America. At the Concours of America. And there's several people would walk up to me and say, yeah, you, you know, see that stripe on that? I did that stripe. <laughs> because these, the, the, this well, is the designer. The, yeah, the designers walk up to you and introduce, yourself, introduce themselves, and they, they let you know what... Um, yeah, uh, what now, they've done. Now, as I go through the book, it's my first impression is it's overwhelmingly GM cars. Of course, they had most of the market back then too. But it, this it, is true. It, and I see some Fords and some Mopar stuff in here too. The Mopar but. guys are crazy. They're they they um, they're big um, big collectors. Um, the GM, yeah, just because it again it, it, back in that day it was fifty percent of the market. Mm -hmm. And why did you pick cars mainly of uh, the 60s and early 70s, and, and some from the 50s as well? As, uh, that's market driven. It's because of the, that's, the, that's what sells. That's right? what sells. That's uh -huh. exactly right. Um, I have a passion for all cars, all designs, um, which is like one of the reasons why I like the Concours so much because there, there's just something for everyone there. But the guys that are buying the cars, that are buying the memorabilia, that are that are are my collectors. And, and this is the, the niche that I've fallen into, is the, the American muscle. Mm -hmm. So what's a painting go for? Um, I, I'm sure they vary, but... Well, an original painting, um, the, the, the different stages. If you commissioned me to do your, your um, um, Chevy C10 with, with, the, with the Harley Davidson and, and the, the, you know, the 32 high boy, that I can't market to anyone else that is just a painting for you. You're going to pay more. You're going to pay more. Um, it's somewhere in the $30,000 range. But the paintings that I can sell reproductions of and that are my own creation, you're talking about uh, between seven and 15000 mm -hmm. Now, if you figure that I've got um, 300 hours in a, in a $7,000 painting, 
I could do better at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> get, and get benefits and, and, and have a day off once in a while. Um, so so w w what I'm telling you is I make money on the rep reproductions. Mm -hmm. But it's because of these creations that I, I, I'm, I'm creating a scene that, that I think that people will, will buy. This is cool stuff. This is really good. Hey, uh, we've got to take another quick commercial break and then we've got to go to rapid fire. But uh, Ben, let's thank our friends right now at Bridgestone. Bridgestone is featuring its third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new technology. Current run-flat tires can offer peace of mind for consumers, but the added mass and the stiffer sidewalls can compromise ride comfort and fuel efficiency. The new third generation Bridgestone run-flat tires reduce heat and improve performance and ride comfort. Whether you're a program manager in the industry or just looking for a set for your personal car, check it out at BridgestoneTire.com. Hey, I forgot to tell everybody that you're going to give us one of these books to give away. I am. And we've got to have some sort of contest to figure out how to give it away. So we've got to tell the audience, stay tuned. We haven't figured this out yet. Okay. Uh, we'll figure something <laughs> right. out. But it's a beautiful book. It's really nicely done. And, uh, you know, I haven't gone through the whole thing myself just yet, but I can't wait to do so. How about um, if someone can tell me the address, the street address of Grand Spalding Dodge in Chicago, Illinois? Ooh, they got a book. Ben, I think we just got our rules. We'll, we'll make it more formal, and, and we'll bring this out in, uh, in another show because we want to make it fair for everybody. Okay. But that's okay. a good one. That's a okay. great suggestion. Okay. <laughs> but stick with us a minute because we might get some questions for you in okay. rapid fire here. But Ben, let's bring up that graphic. All right, and we do have some questions. Jim Haynes says, uh, Dave, how often do people tell you they've been to a dealership that you painted, but you knew really never had existed except in your mind? This happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll do some fictitious dealerships. I have one that is, that's, that's called um, um, Goodbye Oldsmobile. Um, and it's Hilltop Motors. And oh yeah, I, the Hilltop Motors. I, I remember that. That was in you know, um, the, the most famous one was um, uh, the AMC dealership that I did was Capital Motors. Everybody said, oh, that's the one in Win Winnipeg, isn't it? No, no, I just kind of made it up out of my mind it, and and called it Cap. Oh, that's the one in Columbus, Ohio, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the, yes, it happens all the time. Yeah, that's Snoco Station. That was on the corner of of. Yeah. After a while, you should just say, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah you're right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. But you know what? Because of the way you paint, I almost feel like I was there. You're capturing a, a period of time that, even though I was never at any of these places, That's the it's best recognizable compliment. to me. That's the best compliment. You know, it's I like I'm have. remembering something I never knew. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Goggles Pisano wants to know. Uh, what do you see yourself painting two decades from now? No <laughs> dealerships from 2000, I'm guessing. Gee, what a question. Um, I don't know. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> You'll know when you get there yourself, exactly. right? Uh, uh, Bob McElroy. All right. I have no, who idea, uh, no idea who Bob McElroy is, but thanks for walk, uh, writing in. He said, I had the opportunity to meet Dave at Amelia Island this year. Your contribution to automotive history and art is fantastic. We all owe you a debt for preserving history. Well, what a great compliment that is. Thank you very much. That's, that's wonderful. Are, are the, the classic car shows, the concours events, the place for you to go to sell your art? You know, actually, um, they're, a, they're a good event, but there's some muscle car events that, that um, eclipse sales-wise. Um, the the concours events. But the concours events are the most fun just because they're the most interesting. Most interesting people. I mean, and, and and there's some there's some bizarre people out. You know, they, they, being car guy, you Listen, know. Well, this oh, is really? why we like. <laughs> really, <laughs> bizarre people in the car. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never realized yeah, that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Imagine that. It's yeah. one of the things that make this industry fun to be a part of. Actually, yeah. um, here's another question: Are you part of the Automotive Fine Arts Society? I am not. Um, actually, I've never applied. Um, 
I, I know the guys. Um, many of them are friends of mine. Um, I've got my own marketing program. Um, they've got their program. Uh, the only upside I see to, to joining an organization, that organization, is they have an exclusive on Pebble Beach, and Pebble Beach doesn't have muscle cars, so um, I'm not losing anything there. Although I think I probably show pretty well at Pebble Beach. Yeah. But um, no, I'm not. Um, a, a bunch of nice guys, but not part of the club. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan says, he's got more of a comment than a question. He says, what a wonderful show. Thank you for coming on AutoLine After Hours and sharing this beautiful work. And it's great to see that you're enjoying the journey we call life. <laughs> what age did you decide to make the transition from advertising PR to full-time artist? Your passion shows clearly and your work is great. So yeah, when did, when did you make that? And was, it, was that a big, dis, big step for you? I, no, it wasn't a, well, no, it was more of a big step for, for my uh, wife and business part, partner, Marion. Um, back one time, back in 1991, um, I was working in an ad agency and I just came home one day. I just had it, you know, I just said, honey, I quit my job today. And she said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so th then it's evolved since then. I did some work for a publisher in Canada, and then, but I've been self-publishing now for 15 years. So um, it, it was it was gradual and sudden. So let's you know that's uh, there, there were some sudden sudden steps in a in the journey. Okay, Peter, we got a question to you from Mitch, who asks, how do you rate the reliability of your two personal cars? Oh, the, no problems. Either one. Okay, Glenn E says, now that GM is making money faster than they know what to do with it, will they revert to the old ways of doing business? Uh, I really don't think so. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, as, as long as Mark Royce is involved in the trenches, I don't think they're going to revert to, to the old ways. But you never know, but I don't think so. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Mark will keep them uh, steady, but. Uh, it's going to take uh, others yeah, raising the issue to make sure they don't lapse back to that because, you know, you got uh, MBA finance types uh, running the very top of the company and then you've got a board of directors that definitely thinks that way. And, you know, yeah. to those kinds of folks, cars are just commodities as a means to make money. Right. And, uh, and I'm not against making money and companies got to be profitable, but you don't come out with scintillating profits or, or scintillating products. Uh, when you've got that kind of MBA thing, right. which is what exactly Bob Lutz has talked about on this on yeah, the show. exactly. Jim Haynes wants to know, Peter, another brand for Dodge SRT. How many brands will Fiat North America end up with as a backdrop to the rest of the car makers who are getting rid of brands? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I, I truly believe Sergio and company are dreaming about the expansion of, of just how much they can, you know, they keep saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and it's 2014, keep waiting for 2014, man, that's going to be a big year, but, you know, it takes a lot of money. We talked about relaunching Alpha. The, the beginning number is $120 million and it doubles mm -hmm. from there, and, you know, they're talking about all kinds of products, and it's just not going to work that way. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've got uh, some phone calls coming in. Ben, let's bring in the first one. Yeah, John, Rick from San Diego. Hey, with the economy, especially with the stock market thing today, uh, I think I'm starting to think Buick's positioned himself a little bit too high with this luxury thing. I mean, I think the Verona's going to start at 23.5, and the Regal's at 27. That's like a $7,000 difference from the uh, the Cruise and the Malibu. I think it needs to drop to down about $2,000, maybe 21 something for the Verona, and around 25 for the Regal. Uh, soft market, yeah, luxury, but uh, everyone in the luxury market is going to lower their sights a little bit. Uh, any thoughts? Actually, I don't agree. I think you know, if they have to differentiate themselves. And one way to do that is with price. Yeah, and they have to go their own way, or they have no reason for being. So, I I, I would agree with you, Peter, because uh, the last thing that Chevrolet needs is a Buick that's just a little bit more. Yeah, you, no. you've really got to separate them. Uh, now, Rick might be raising a good question. Maybe they've gone a little too much. But remember, you're talking MSRP prices, and that may not be what happens as the final transaction price in the dealership. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, there's usually a wide 
<laughs> variants there. That's right. Uh, ben, let's bring in uh, another phone call here. Hi guys, it's Jonathan Brown. I'm All right, Jonathan. Jersey, big in the show as always. A quick question: The Buick Regal GS was announced pricing today thirty-five thousand dollars to take a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Looks like a nice vehicle with two hundred and seventy horsepower. I was wondering what your impressions were. Do you think it would compete well with the Audi A4, which I think has two hundred and ten horsepower, and the BMW three twenty eight, which has two sixty eight rear wheel drive? Um, the ATS was shown today as well. Uh, give you any insights that you can. Uh, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Yeah, a number of questions here, but some good stuff. Well, you know, yeah, the new GS is thirty-five grand, but you know, again, that's back to the pricing. You either believe you belong there and you price accordingly and you deliver the goods, or you don't. And so Buick's got to play there. That's just below the entry level, pretty much of the three series BMW. Uh, goes up against a obscenely loaded Mini <laughs> Cooper, or Countryman, whatever. Um, you know, I don't know. I. I you know, every manufacturer is playing, planning, focusing on thirty-five thousand dollars. What's the average transaction price again? It, it, it's awfully close to like, thirty-five. It's thirty-three plus. Yeah, and um, well, actually, I should, that's not transaction. That's the average MSRP is thirty-three to thirty-four thousand. Yeah. I think the average transaction is about thirty thousand. So with two hundred seventy horsepower, yeah, the Buick's offering a little more than the A4 and and. Well, the new one series that's coming is going to be right there. I mean, it's a train wreck. And so people are going to say, well, why Buick? Why 35000 for a Buick when, when I can buy a one series or an A4? That's the billion dollar question for General Motors. Are you really going to make this Buick thing work? I know you sell them like hotcakes in China, but you're going to capture the enthusiast mindset with a $35,000 Buick. Good luck. Good I luck mean, is right. I don't it, think it can be done, but it could take years. It will take years because I don't think anybody who's interested in a BMW or an Audi right now is going to say, you know what, I'm going to go down the street to the Buick deal. Yeah, no, they're not. I, that's not happening yet. And it's the same with, with Chrysler and Fiat and Alpha, and they're going to bring Alpha in. And oh, yeah, I'm going to go check out that Alpha. Really? Mm -hmm. You're going to spend money and you look at the real sale, resale numbers on your BMW and your Audi. And you're going to just go run down to that alpha dealer? It doesn't work that way. And to Jonathan's point, uh, Mark Royce, again going back to uh, the conference up at Traverse City, showed uh, a sketch, a partial sketch well, of I've the seen, Cadillac ATS. I've seen the ATS. It's mm -hmm. a very nice package. Right. Very nice package. And they're, they're taking the CTS up in size to fit the ATS. Right. Which again is going to be very close to the RS and the 3 Series and the A4 and everything that we've been talking about. But Cadillac does have a shot at getting BMW and Audi buyers to go into the Cadillac Exactly, store. because they're not reinventing the wheel. Remember, they've been rebuilding Cadillac for 10 years. And yeah, they have a shot with the ATS, whereas Buick, that's a real tough sell. Real tough. Well, as we've talked before, you just got to keep hammering away at it. And if you do the right things, in about 20 years, it'll start to pay off. Yeah. And, you know, MBA types don't have a lot of patience. No. Their patience is about three months. Yeah. Because that's when the next quarter ends. Exactly. Hey, we've got another phone call. Let's bring that one in, Ben. Hi, John. This is Rich. Um, you often say that GM has 50% of the market. But what was the actual number of cars they sold in a particular year where they had 50% of the market? Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, well, GM hasn't had 50% of the market in, you know, 30-plus years. Yeah, yeah 71 it, maybe. It, it's been a long time. Exactly right, Dave. And so I'd have to go back and look at how big the market was then, but I'm going to say probably... Uh, at its peak in the 70s, let's see, in 1978, the U.S. market did about 15 million units. So if that's right, GM had to be close to 7 million at that time, which is more or about the same of what it sells globally right now, awfully close to what it sells globally. And I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I apologize, but I'll bet the numbers are not that far off. That's dominance. That's dominance. When GM was in their top of their game, man, it was dominant. 
They did. I mean, they even dictated the colors. Whatever Harley Earl and Bill Mitchell and, and company came up with, they dictated everything. I mean, if you weren't, a few victories, you know, when Ford brought out the Mustang, you know, that was the first, one of the few out and out grand slam home runs against General Motors. And General Motors reeled, but the first Camaro was pretty hot. Still my favorite, yeah. 67, 68. Still my favorite computer. I agree with you. I, the I, size of it. Really? The feel of it when you walk in. You like the 69, I right? do. Yeah. I do. Right. And if you talk about that, because I have these color chip books that I, that I mix paints to, it's fascinating to see the trends from from 1949 to until, until into the 70s, that, that at, at some points there, there maybe was um, um, back in the... Um, well, 59, there was only one red in the General Motors lineup. And a couple years later, there was six or seven reds. Um, it, it's just fascinating, the, the, the color palettes that we've gone through in automotive. And today it sucks. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. we get three different interiors, you know, True. black, beige, and gray. And you get a palette of typically 10 or 12 exterior colors. And six of those are various shades of gray and silver. Right. It's terrible. And, uh, you know, look, I, I love manufacturing, and I understand why you have to have as efficient a manufacturing process as possible. But that's what's dictating it. We're letting the manufacturing guy say, no, we can't let the customer have this kind of choice because that'll add complexity in the plant. The only way you can do it, unfortunately, are the, the wealthy who can do paint-to-sample colors, you know. Or we go back to, remember, a couple of weeks we had Thomas yeah, Crum yeah. here, and he's got a whole new way of building cars that would account accommodate as much customer choice as the customer might choose. Yeah. And, you know, that era, don't forget, back to when GM was dominant, I mean, they had back-to-back -back two of the greatest designers in automotive history. There was a uh, no run of any car company can duplicate that run. And they, Harley Earl. Earl and handed off to Bill Mitchell. Bill Mitchell, Mitchell yeah. That was yeah. the greatest run. And guess what? That's when GM's heyday was. And I would add, too, they both reported directly to the chairman of the corporation. Exactly. They didn't report to the head of engineering or the head of manufacturing or product planning. Or they dictated, too. They the did dictate. Oh, well, yeah. you know. They and, did. Yeah. And don't forget back then, uh, if you were a divisional general, man, uh, general manager of General Motors, you, it was like you were your own potentate of a small country because you were responsible for everything. You had control of everything, manufacturing, design, marketing, everything, except when you went to go see Mitchell and he'd say, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and again, you know, that's, that's kind of the model that Volkswagen follows, as we've talked about here. You know, if you're the CEO of Audi, you're the CEO of a car company with your own board of directors, your own annual report, the whole nine yards. You don't have, you're not a marketing guy that's dictated to by design, engineering, and manufacturing. Bill Mitchell did the 1963 Corvette, and my favorite line about the 19, uh, those mid-year Corvettes was um, Roger Penske said it has just enough lift to make it a bad airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the Stingray was still, uh, for my money, the most sensational new car uh, when it hit the streets in the U.S. But at least they're the talking about aerodynamics yeah. now. You know, it's, sting, it's not the stingray was what it hot, looks like, but then, what a, how it drives. Yeah, it was hot until uh, Shelby stuffed that Ford motor in that little aluminum AC. Right. And the, the old power-to-weight ratio, we just said. But for a fleeting moment of time, that stingray was just, when you saw one on the street, it was... Well, you know, I think I've said this before, but I came from a Ford family, and I about threw up when I saw that stingray because it was so so beautiful, oh, yeah. and I, I wanted it to hate is. it so much yeah. because it wasn't a Ford. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's how it was back in those days. You know, you were a Ford family or a GM family or, you know, Chrysler. Yeah, well, we were, you know, obviously. Obviously GM. GM to, up to my eyeballs, and then except when we brought that first Cobra home, it was like, wow, yeah. this thing is awesome. <laughs> right. 
Well, look, uh, we're at the, the top of the show here again, so uh, we ought to wrap it up. But Dave Snyder, thanks for coming thanks along, for coming man. Off. This, this so is much. this is really cool, man. And uh, you know, uh, I love your suggestion of how to hold the contest to you know have some one of our lucky viewers win this book. Okay. But great having you here, and it's Peter. Good, John. Good this to is see great. You. And uh, hey, we've got another great show coming up next week. We got Ed Welburn coming here, oh, yeah. Ed, so Ed's that always... that's going to be fantastic. Well, I'm going to tell. I'm going to email Ed if he doesn't bring us a hint of what the the C7 Corvette looks like. I mean, even a like they pull the car, you know, just show us a little <laughs> corner of it. Right. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to email and give him some shit about. Well, that. we'll tie him up until yeah. they send it over. Yeah. Well, we got to wrap it up here, but uh, remember, folks, uh, we've got Open Line coming. Uh, you can go look, check that all out at bit.ly slash open podcast, B-I-T dot L-Y slash open podcast. Uh, they've got a great show with Nick Richards from Buick, and that's pretty cool. Don't forget that you can friend us at facebook.com slash autoline Detroit. Follow us at twitter.com slash autoline. Go to the website autoextremist.com or twitter.com slash autoextremist or even facebook.com slash autoextremist. Dave, you got any uh, website that you can tell our viewers about to check out your art? Yeah, davidsnydercarart.com. And Snyder is? S-N-Y-D-E-R. Gotcha. Okay, so say that again. davidsnydercarart.com. Cool. Thanks. That's for our pod people. <laughs> right. And uh, also, don't forget that you can listen to this show and all our shows on your BlackBerry or smartphone via Stitcher. And we've got a little deal going with Stitcher right now where you can win $100. Just go to stitcher.com slash autoline. And when you register your phone, enter the promotion code autoline. And you can get the app at the iTunes store or the Android store. And thanks again, folks. We'll see you next week. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze, get used to more. And by Hyundai, experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. You know, it's too bad that the coolest office in the entire auto industry is Ed Walburn's office. Right. That was the office that um, Harley Earl had and then Bill Mitchell had. And they haven't changed it, have they? No, it's, it's intact. Now, the funny thing is, uh, I was in that office in 1960, I don't know, five or six with Mitchell. And, you know, <clears throat> to my mind, it was so big and then a while ago, I went back and I saw it's Ed, and I saw Ed, and I was just like, "Wow," you know, because I was in this office mm -hmm. uh, fifty years ago or something. And it was just, uh, but it's intact. And of course, Ed's a chaparral freak, and he's got some beautiful chaparral memorabilia. And um, but you know, it's just a beautiful office. I've wow. been in there several times as well uh, it's too over bad the we years. Aren't doing the show from there. From there, yeah. right. And it, I, you're right because just to take a camera through the office and as I recall there's controls in the desk where you can bring things up, slide them around and all yeah, that. Yeah, and then stuff. Uh, just around the corner from it is a private dining room with a uh, electronically controlled lazy Susan in the center of it. I remember that. I was just it was just <laughs> wild. Well, that's a Serenin design, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, but Ed's and that's office. part of that whole era of of um, the, the impression that you make upon the people that were brought into that office. Mm -hmm. um, well, just the just, stairway going up the stairs yeah, there. That's it, another thing. That would be a fun show. I mean, just right. take the cameras and see that stairway, and just yeah, back in the fifties, if you were summoned to GM Design for an interview, it was just like yeah, okay. This is like the bleeding edge of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, that was the first true automotive campus. Yeah. You know, technical campus, design engineering, and There's all that sort of thing. Yeah. Right yeah, 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 right.
That's great, Ben. Ben, you're, yeah. you're, you're the man, <laughs> to tell you. But yeah, look at all that wood. Everything is like it was. See that bat phone underneath the... Yeah. 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 Everything was just like it was. I mean, the whole interior of GM design, the lobby, uh, I could just imagine if you were a 22-year-old designer. Well, Peter Brock, who designed the Cobra Daytona Coupe, was, was hired at GM. He was working there, I think, at 18 mm -hmm. or 19. Is that right? And he was involved in the early work on the Stingray with Larry Shinoda. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he went on to, to design the fabulous Cobra Daytona Coupe, you know. But yeah, when, when you go to uh, GM Design, it is still very special. Very special. Well, I, I like the whole tech center, you know, because uh, uh, Saarinen designed it to, to feel like a campus. Yeah. And they've managed to retain that feel. And I'll tell you, when, when uh, in fall, when the trees are churning and the light hits the buildings because the buildings have different colors. I mean, it's pretty, pretty special still. Yeah. Even though a lot of the buildings are empty. Yeah, that's right. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, this Thank was you great having you on. Much. Oh, yeah. I, I hope I did okay. You did great. Okay. You did great. Okay. No, this, is, uh, this is really cool. And uh, probably next week we'll have uh, the contest rules figured out. Okay. And uh, I'll bet we get uh, a lot of people interested in it. Okay.